Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Those that are watching on live stream this evening, we welcome you and thank you. God bless you for watching. Many people today are actually celebrating Christmas amongst uh, Christian people. It's Christmas Eve for them. Uh, tomorrow's Christmas. For them, actually, the, it's kind of interesting because it's a... Uh, uh, a Catholic holiday, quite frankly. I know a lot of people celebrate this as the birth of Yeshua. And, uh, and I think that's a nice thing as far as that goes there, but, uh, but it is a Mass for Christ. Uh, we don't really know when he was born. There's a lot of different people think that he might have been born in the spring. Some believe he was born in the fall of the year. And I'm not really privy to that either, which way. Uh, but I would like to real quick just point out something, though, that the Pope said himself. <clears throat> not that you guys really care that much about it, but I do care about what he said lately. This is on your newswire.com. It comes... Uh, here it's called News Truth Unfiltered, and this is something they're quoting Pope Francis there. And those of you that can't see the, the Pope there, let me get him up big enough here for you to see on the screen there. But Pope Francis is talking about that this may be the last Christmas people celebrate, at least in the conditions that we're celebrating them in now. Pope Francis told a crowd in St. Peter's Square that the Christmas... Let me, let me make all that a little bit bigger for you guys that are watching live as well. Uh, <clears throat> normally I have all this up already, but par pardon me for that. Uh, he told the crowd in St. Peter's Square that this Christmas might be the last one for humanity. Now, I don't believe it's going to be the last Christmas season, I, I guess would be the nice way to put that there. But I can guarantee you one thing. It's going to probably be the last one like he says. It'll be normal. In a grim speech, the Pope said that the current chaotic state of the world marks the beginning of the end times, and that this time, next year, the world is likely to be unrecognizable. That's his own statement. Francis, who previously announced the beginning of World War III, had labeled this year's Christmas as a charade during a mass at the Casa Santa Maria earlier in the month. We are close to, to Christmas. There will be lights. There will be parties, bright trees, even nativity scenes all decked out while the world continues to wage war, he said earlier in December. The pontiff, who turned 79 on Thursday, elaborated on his views this weekend, telling a crowd, while the world starves, burns, and descends further into chaos, we should realize that this year's Christmas celebrations for those who choose to celebrate it may be their last. Now, I think in the context of what he's saying here, because I hate to turn uh, the Pope's words into something that he really doesn't mean, uh, he's probably referring to here, in other words, they may die in a battle or something of that case there. Uh, but nonetheless, he does speak about it being the end times. We've often stated that we believe that the Vatican, being the head of all the world governments and all the world's religious systems, at least that's their claim, uh, and we know that he's trying to bring about a new world order, which he announced there in, uh, at the United Nations meeting in the United States here this past September, 23rd, 24th, and 25th there. And Russia, of course, is opposing the new world order, opposing the Illuminati, Makes you wonder how long um, President Putin will last with, with that type of rhetoric there. Uh, but nonetheless, I have to agree with uh, President Putin when it comes to that. I have a lot of respect for the man for opposing such a global world dominant power. And if anybody's got the ability to oppose him, he's got a little bit of ability there to be able to do just that. In fact, Vladimir Putin is doing very much like a statesman himself. He is gain garnering support from around the world in order to back up any fight that he might get involved in in the Middle East there with NATO and their allies. In fact, today he was working with India. The U.S. has also been kind of pandering to India here in the, in the last recent months there, but now President Putin has as well. And India showed strong solidarity for the right for Syria as an independent state, backing Russia and anything that they're doing there. So Russia continues to build Eastern partners, Iran, India, China. Now, some people might think North Korea is not much of a partner, and I never have seen Putin really take North Korea very seriously. But nonetheless, I'm sure North Korea would be glad to jump right along with the bandwagon as well, because North Korea now has their crazy bomb out there that could split the earth wide open. 
if it is true that they actually have this. At any rate, though, <clears throat> Pope Francis and his uh, Vatican regime there that is trying to control the world, they are trying to manufacture a seven-year tribulation. They're taking Daniel's prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel, and they're trying to manufacture that. As we spoke just the other day about the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2 about Jerusalem being a city for all nations where the people would actually come from around the world and pray and seek and the law would go from Jerusalem. Now this clearly is a millennial reign passage. But when Shimon Perez with Pope John Paul II back in 1993 and 1994 signed the accord to allow that sovereignty of the Vatican over the city of Jerusalem, over the old city, over all the holy sites there, they were certainly putting together their own plans to bring about Isaiah chapter 2 there about this international city. Then Shimon Perez, the president of the country, replaced by Rivlin in recent days here, he vowed to bring a United Nations force in. They were already with the agreement back then, but Yasser Arafat, he ended up causing a little bit of waves in their plan. Because you see, the Pope and Shimon Perez were looking at building a third temple on the Temple Mount. But Yasser Arafat would not agree to that. It's kind of funny how Yasser Arafat died right after that. Of course, Israel was blamed for poisoning him. You ever think that maybe it was one of those priests that were coming in and maybe bringing lunch to Yasser Arafat that was actually the cause of the poisoning of this man? Palestinians have been quick to blame the Israelis, but they forget that the very Catholic Church there that backs them and gives them all the support and won't allow anyone to speak against them. Just ask Avi Lipkin. Avi Lipkin had a meeting at the Vatican. He was unable to attend. His son was there. And then they set up a meeting him with the Pontiff of Israel. And the Pontiff of Israel asked Avi straight up, if your organization is against the Palestinians, we will have nothing to do with you. That's pretty blatant words, I would say. So when the Vatican couldn't get Yasser Arafat, to listen to the Vatican the way he is commanded to do, they had to make sure he was taken off the scene. Just like Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres had a problem there, so according to Barry Chamish's book, Who Assassinated Yitzhak Rabin? He clearly was done away with as well by those that have been put in power by Rome in the state of Israel. Well, to say the least, now they're working on preparing for the building of the Third Temple. Even Yehuda Glick, and I believe Yehuda may be just oblivious to the whole thing going on, but Mr. Friedman got him involved in the gold mine down in Elat. As we looked at the other day in Second Kings there, it appears to be that that chest that has had the hole drilled in it is the gold mine being drilled in Elat, a place for you to put money at, to invest in. So later they can say, we found the trove of gold. Is hidden in the temple all along. Maybe instead they'll find a bunch of money, a bunch of gold buried there around the Temple Mount or someplace that Israel does have sovereignty over so that they can say, yes, we now have the money to build the third temple. But Yehuda has been very instrumental in helping to galvanize the Arabic world. Turkey, very much behind him. Notice this, all the NATO members, all those that are close to the Vatican. Anyway, that time is coming. Kind of getting on a rant right there, but uh, let's go to what the title is on, at least the title of everything is on the uh, on uh, live stream there. We are talking about CNN's false headlines that are going on. Now, their headlines are based upon the story that you see pictured on your screen now. This here was a stabbing attack by terrorists, Palestinian terrorists there at Jaffa Gate there. How many people that have visited Israel that have walked that very sidewalk coming down the hill from Ben Yudah Market, maybe from your hotel or whatever it is that you've come into, practically every tourist enters in through Joppa Gate at one time or another. On this day here, it wasn't so lucky for two rabbis who both lost their lives at the hands of Arab terrorists. Two young women police women there near the gate itself responded quickly to the scene, unable to save the lives of the, of the Jewish men that were there, but they did 
eliminate the terrorists that were on scene. Also from one report that I gathered as well that one, one Palestinian that was trying to fight them off was also killed. You might say if the Palestinian, if the report is true that a Palestinian was trying to fight them off, I would have to consider him a hero for trying to fight them off. If he lost his life, that man did die a hero. The Palestinian Authority probably wouldn't agree with that. But there are good Palestinians out there. Contrary to popular belief, there are some there that do care. They do have Jewish friends, just as the Jews have Palestinian friends. So God bless that man as he risked his own life to fight off these terrorists. At any rate there, let's move on down to what happened here. The, uh, the false journalism borderline of incitement. This here is an article that came out today. Uh, in Israel there, Israel's government press office appealed Thursday on to the CNN and CBS networks requesting clarification in light of outwardly biased coverage of yesterday's terrorist attack in Jerusalem. In the attack, two Arab terrorists launched a stabbing spree at the old city's Yaffa Gate, murdering one victim and seriously wounding another, while a third was uh, accidentally shot dead by security forces while trying to fight them off. One terrorist was killed and the other seriously wounded. In a letter to CNN, Prep Press Office Director Nitsan Chin noted that this is not the first time that criticism has been raised in regards to the network's coverage. I ask you to explain the difference between the initial CNN news report by Oren Lieberman in Jerusalem and the title of the screen shortly thereafter. The letter further states that, needless to say, we believe that, that uh, combining two killers with two victims into four dead is not only false, but is also unethical and borders on incitement because the audience can easily misinterpret this. Now, to me, that's not even the worst one that actually came out. Uh, but what he's speaking about here is, uh, this here is uh, Mr. Uh, um, I believe Mr. Lieberman right here in the report here. One attacker in custody, the other shot dead. Now, even in this here, you can see the bias in that. The attacker, one is dead, and the other one is in custody, but there's no mention of the dead Jews, the dead Israeli people there, the dead, the dead Orthodox men that were killed there. And the other one here, this is by CBS, There's, this is directly, it's an actual uh, screenshot from CBS's uh, initial headline, Two Palestinians Killed After Stabbing Attack in Jerusalem. Well, you might assume that the, the Jewish people were doing the stabbing attack. But nonetheless, the bias towards Israel, towards an Israeli citizen that is murdered, why didn't they have it reworded as two Israelis killed and then maybe the stabbing, uh, the stabbing terrorists were shot dead or something of this effect? But no, it's clearly to make it look like the Palestinians are victims. You have to understand that one of the reasons why I'm very irritated myself as well over something like this is because in Israeli News Live, we have actually taken the steps to be equal in our own reporting regarding the terrorist activity that goes on in Israel. In the case of the incident where the two girls, 14 and 16 year old girls armed with scissors began to attack people at a bus stop, they had stabbed actually one 70 year old Palestinian man thinking that he was a Jewish man to begin with. But a security policeman rushes to the scene at the incident that is going on he quickly shoots down the first one. While he is shooting down the first girl, the 16-year-old, the elder of the two, a, a bystander actually takes an Israeli with a chair, runs up and rams the 14-year-old down, down to the ground with the chair. Now, as you watch the entire scene, and we shared this on Israeli News Live, in detail, we went slowly but surely so you could see everything that takes place there. This 14-year-old girl still laying on the ground, face down. The security officer comes up and shoots her also again, twice in the back. And the girl dies of her wounds. We made an outcry about that. We actually made it with Israel National News who posted the article as well as we went so far as to doing our own report on it. And we spoke about the shame that has been brought upon the people of Israel who are supposed to take the high moral ground 
When this young girl was down, the officer should have went over there. Even if it would have hurt her worse, put his knee into her back and make sure she is disarmed. You are talking about a 14-year-old child who died of her wounds. And we condemn the act of the officer for doing so. We cause so much stir over the matter that even the Israeli authorities begin to do an investigation. Other news agencies begin to pick up on it as well and notice what actually happened. Even the 16-year-old girl, to me, was shot more than she should have been shot. Once the girl was down, why continue to shoot her? She did survive. And nonetheless, yes, I do realize they're terrorists, and most people would say, well, they may have had a bomb on themselves. I lived in Israel during the Second Intifada. I was in a suicide bombing in French Hill, September of 2014. So I do know what it's like. And in this whole intifada thus far, we've not had that type of threat. So there was no realistic thing to believe that they were armed with a bomb. And even then, when the person is down, you should use the common sense to disarm the girl. Not outright kill her. Nonetheless, I do not know what will become of that story, but the issue that we're making here is that even though we are a Jewish type of news agency, we are believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. We stand with Israel very firmly. But then again, we also stand with what's truth. And we do realize that there is much incitement of terrorism from directly from the Palestinian Authority. And this is what Israel is dealing with, a government that incites the violence with a world, a news world, media world, that is out there making the Palestinian people as if they're victims. We do know that the situation for the Palestinian people is not the best in the world when they are isolated. That is true. I realize that. But the Palestinian people do not have Israel to thank for that. They have the Vatican to thank for that because the Vatican has made sure their life stays miserable because the Vatican is using them in order to gain power over this land. The Palestinians, according to Daniel chapter 11, you're only a pawn in the game. He comes up strong with a small people. You are that small people. The Palestinians, you're that small people. And it's Rome that is using you in order to get control of Jerusalem. And they're not much worried about how many suffer or how many die in order for them to gain what they're after. Read Ezekiel chapter 35. When you get a little time there, you'll find out that he says, these two countries, these two nations will be mine. It's Edom right there. All you have to do to find out who Edom is is read Obadiah's prophecy. He clearly identifies modern-day Rome as Edom or Esau's descendants. These two nations shall be mine. So see, the Vatican's not satisfied only with being able to get Jerusalem. They want all of Israel. This is what they're intent on doing, and it's what they will do. At least according to Daniel chapter 11, verse 14, the lawless ones of Israel are trying to help marry the vision. And marrying that vision means to bring the Vatican back into Israel once again, to reset up Biblical history from 2,000 years ago where Rome was over Israel. It's exactly what they're trying to do. You put a United Nations force in Israel anywhere, and that means Rome's military is there. The Roman soldiers are actually there. Anyway, though, the bias uh, articles here continue. Two Israelis dead after stabbing attack in Jerusalem. Two Palestinians assailants killed. They re, uh, renamed the article. Uh, once the outcry of Israel came out uh, regarding that. So, <clears throat> at any rate, though, in, in other news there, let's move on here. Also, we have the Turkish uh, Prime Minister, Israel's deal only meant to help Gaza. That's something that the Turkish Prime Minister is saying right now. Erdo Erdogan, uh, I'm sorry, not Erdogan, uh, Ahmet uh, Davutoglu, uh, on Tuesday spoke about the reproachment agreement talks with Israel during a parliament group meeting and said the goal is to benefit Palestinian Arabs. 
Uh, no one is more sensitive on Gaza, Palestine than us, he said, according to the Turkish Harriet Daily News. Our sole goal is to bring solutions to problems of our Palestinian brothers. This is the main objective behind our talks for the normalization of relationship with Israel. That's the only reason? Let me tell you another reason why they're doing this. Yes, it is for the Palestinians, there's no doubt, because Turkey is very much ran, it's a NATO nation ran by the Vatican. And all the Vatican has to do is put a little bit of pressure on the United States and Washington there, and Washington will tell Turkey what to do, and Turkey will obey everything they say. That's why we see the confrontations over in Syria right now, and the threat of war between Turkey and, of course, Russia. And the United States not backing down to stand with Turkey, even with the overwhelming evidence that Turkey is nothing but guilty of harboring the fugitives of an ISIS state, helping them, sending in sarin gas. Their own people have reported on them and found them guilty. This regime of gassing the Syrian people, something that was blamed on Bashar al-Assad the entire time when the man was never guilty of it. Never guilty at all. And now the U.S. has given a 60 wild mile, excuse me, 60 mile wide border working with the Turks of a safe zone for ISIS militants to flee to. <coughs> no wonder why Russia has a bone to pick with America. All right, let's move on now. Greek parliament votes to recognize an independent Palestinian state. They're all jumping in the bandwagon. You know, in actu actuality, let me just say this here, because President Putin, although I can agree with him on some of his policies, one thing I don't agree with him on, and that is that he is for a Palestinian state as well. In fact, he was the first one to recognize him as a state back in the 70s, no less. And it's his own deal that he's done with the Palestinians for the oil rights. It's one of the reasons why I believe he's in Syria to protect what is rightfully his in the way he sees it. So, but anyway, uh, the Palestinian parliament has come along with that. Uh, and the Greek parliament has unanimously voted to recognize Palestine as an independent state. It comes amid an official visit to Greece by the Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas. The Greek premier Alexis uh, Sapra said on Monday that the vote to recognize Palestinian statehood would only serve to commit formal recognition at a later appropriate date. Isn't that interesting? An appropriate date. Why does he call it an appropriate date? You see, the Vatican's already declared them a state. And once the Vatican declared them a state, the Palestinians are a state. That's why we already see the different infrastructure going in into Jerusalem to internationalize Jerusalem. They're not only trying to marry the vision, they're trying to fulfill the vision, bringing it to pass. But remember, God said they will fail. God's going to send two men, two men, anointed with the spirit of Moses and Elijah. Isn't that interesting? Two witnesses that will come in that will cause the whole plan to collapse. No wonder why Psalm 83 says that they have taken counsel against thy hidden ones. The two witnesses. You know, it's interesting. Elijah has already been back more than once. Elijah came back. The spirit of Elijah, that is, was on Elisha. Later we see Jesus said, if thou can receive it, this was Elijah that was foretold of to come. Speaking of John the Baptist. Now, John's already dead at the at Mount Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah do appear together, a, a type of the coming of the two witnesses. And they're discussing with Yeshua what would happen when he dies. You see, Moses doesn't have to come back. He's chose to come back. That's something that the Lord revealed to me just the other day. Why is Moses actually coming back? Because something that he did back in his life when he was here on the earth, he will live it out this time. When Israel had sinned so greatly in the sight of God, God was ready to wipe out the entire nation and start over with Moses because of their sin of idolatry, making the golden calf from Egypt, in fact, that's kind of interesting. They made the golden calf, right? With the, with the pillars there, um, 
with, with, the, with the bull, using the, 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 the Egyptian bull with the horns where the sun god comes from. And I was wanting to show this with you guys. I actually come across this just the other day, had no idea it existed, looked on the internet. Yes, people have showed this, but it's never been gone very popular as of yet. This right here is made by the Germans. It is called Isis Cola. It was in an organic uh, vegetarian restaurant that me and my wife visited there. You notice on there the sun disk in the middle, setting right there inside of the horns itself, the Egyptian goddess Isis, the goddess of fertility. Isis, the demonic Arab group there in the Middle East there that has been formed by really funded and put together by the United States, Turkey, and of course if they do it, the Vatican puts them together. But when I saw that, I asked them if they'd sell me a bottle of it that I could take with me so I could share it with you guys. That's what the Vatican has on there. You got the little bull horns there on their little altar there where they put their little, uh, their little round sun god waist, uh, wafer in there that they call their communion. You don't think that they're not a religion born from Egypt? Sure they are. Why do you think they give them the name Isis for their warriors over there to do the dirty work? It comes right from the God that they worship. You know, I thought that'd be interesting to share with you guys as well. Let's move on though. Um, I want to kind of forget where I left off there, but forgive me there. I, I want to share something with you guys though that's very important here. And this is... Okay guys, anyway... Uh, RT News put out some footage today called Apocalyptic Scenes of Damascus Suburb Obliterated by Violent Clashes. It's an RT exclusive drone footage. Uh, those of you that can see this in the image there on your screen now, it is just in shambles, the city here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share with you that footage there so that you can see this as well. Um, just to kind of, they're doing a little bit of an aerial view of this here, and I want you guys to be able to see this as well. They're using a little uh, small portable drone there just to show you a little bit of the footage there. All the buildings are just totally demolished. If they're not completely in rubble, they're fairly, fairly near to it, uh, no doubt. In the far back there was actually Syria, uh, excuse me, Damascus. And you know, we, we all know, we're very familiar with the famous verses there of, of Isaiah chapter 17 about Damascus being a ruinous heap. And this is what you're seeing in some of this aerial footage there. But what I wanted to share with you is some things that you may not know about the passages in Isaiah, although this has probably been spoken about for, for, for millennia already, the prophecies here. I want to share with you something that might give you a little insight and it'll also show you some things prophetically that are going on regarding Damascus. Chapter 17, verse 1, The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. So first it is taken away from being a city, which is what we have seen in the last several years there. Because of the war-torn region there, Damascus does not function as a normal city, and it will become a ruinous heap. Now, I have a feeling this will probably be more fulfilled if Russia and the U.S. get into a war with each other there, because that's what Russia is doing now is protecting this area. And even we seen just the other day that Bashar al-Assad and his wife actually visited a church in Damascus, only a couple of kilometers away from where ISIS forces were actually at, our rebel strongholds that are backed by the U.S. It makes it very delicate for Russia trying to keep out of a fight directly with NATO and their allies, and yet at the same time not knocking out ISIS, yet it is the U.S.-backed rebels that are there trying to topple Bashar al-Assad, and Putin is there to protect Assad. When does he keep bombing them, and the U.S. finally get enough as well and attack back? Anyway, the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. These modern-day equivalents have become nothing but a big pile of rubble. And in that day it shall come 
I'm sorry, uh, verse 3. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. And that's something that kind of concerned me right there. The fortress also, also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. We did a little footage recently was speaking about Bashar al-Assad, looking at some prophetic things there. And it appears that President Bashar al-Assad will end up being assassinated from biblical prophecies that we've already shared you. I wish I had that with me right now as I was looking at that, but I don't have it with me. Ephraim, and uh, Ephraim, his fortress also shall cease. It shall cease from Ephraim. That makes me wonder if the U.S. doesn't lose power in a battle there. Is this implying that Ephraim is the United States or NATO in any way? Is it Great Britain? What may be the case in this? That's a little bit still cloudy for me. It says, And the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. The remnant of Syria. Have you ever wondered what the glory of the children of Israel is? How could a city become totally obliterated by war, and yet God likens the remnant of Syria to be like the glory of the children of Israel? Well, there's a very interesting scripture in Proverbs 17. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's like the same chapter as well, in a parallel there. Let me just take you over there to Proverbs. I want to share with you. This is where you will know what God is speaking about in relation to this particular prophecy. When you go to Proverbs 17, I want you to go to verse 6. And it states right there in verse 6, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of the children are their fathers. So when God says right here, that the glory, that the, that, the, that the remnant of Israel will be like the glory of the children of Israel. What happened to their fathers? They were taken into captivity. They were exiled. The children of Israel, were, their fathers were exiled to all the world. Well, it looks like we're seeing that prophecy already coming to pass as well. The remnant of Syria have been exiled to all the world. Reminds me of that one particular um, prophecy of the, the Norwegian lady, 90 years old, back in 1968, when she stated that when you see these Arabic people coming up in huge numbers up into Europe, even into Scandinavia, they'll be hated by the people here. And they will treat them as they did the Jews back before World War II. I think we're living in that day all over again. And that's what we're seeing once again. We are seeing prophecy being fulfilled. They are, they are, as the prophecy says, they will be like the glory of the children of Israel. Their forefathers, in other words, that went into exile, so were the remnant of Syria. They have been scattered to all the world. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, a brief prophetic segment of our broadcast. Shalom and good evening.